Derek Anderson was just, I, I mean, Mr. Cool. To me, he was kind of the heart and soul of this basketball team. When you talk about players that had it, Derek Anderson had it, which he did struggle to maximize, but he also struggled with injuries. Yet he made the most out of what he had, as he entered the NBA having already torn both ACLs and was still able to outjump 95% of the league. Anderson is probably most remembered for his days in college, where he joined the Kentucky Wildcats as a junior transfer and helped them to the 96 NCAA championship before tearing his ACL as a senior. But that didn't stop him from being drafted in the first round and being handpicked by Michael Jordan to represent his new brand. He had the talent to be incredible on offense, but it didn't always come with good decision making and shot selection, yet he still had the ability to score at all three levels, and was a good passer on top of that. And before his knees fully caught up to him, he could be a solid two-way player as he had active hands and quick reflexes, allowing him to force a lot of turnovers. At times, he's been painted as greedy or having attitude issues, but Derek Anderson has overcome more than most and his whole story shows just how great of a person he is. And lasting over a decade in the NBA after what he went through in college only makes you wonder how good he would have been without the injuries. Let's jog your memory. A Louisville, Kentucky native, Derek Anderson has a life story that's hard to believe. At around 10 years old, Anderson was abandoned by both parents and spent the next few years homeless until moving in with his aunt and uncle. He lost his half-sister to senseless violence and almost lost his own life in a fight. Then, at just 14 years old, he became a father. So Anderson spent his high school years caring for a child, yet still dominating on the basketball court. And perhaps even more impressive is that he became one of the nation's top players without the prestigious summer basketball camps. As even though he would be invited to them, his summers were spent working so that he could provide for his son, who he would gain solo custody of when he was just 15, which speaks just as much to his character as it does to him as a player. Anderson attended Doss High School, where he would be a four-year starter. He would play point guard for the Dragons and help lead them to a combined 94 and 35 record during his time there, with his senior season being his best, as he averaged 24 points, 9.7 rebounds, and 3.2 assists per game, while shooting 58% from the field and 62% from deep, leading Doss to a 29 and 4 record. Anderson's senior year would see him named a Kentucky All-Star, as well as finish as runner-up for Kentucky Player of the Year. Anderson would say that he was set to commit to Louisville until he heard that head coach Denny Crum was intending to redshirt the entire freshman class. And when Anderson tried to call Crum, he couldn't get through, but then he got a call from someone else. Head coach Randy Ayers at Ohio State, who would drive three hours to see Anderson and offer him a scholarship to fill in for Buckeyes star swingman Jim Jackson, who had decided to enter the 92 draft, and Anderson would accept. The loss of Jackson was a big hit to a Buckeyes team coming off an Elite Eight appearance, but they still featured junior forward Lawrence Funderburk and junior guard Jamie Skelton. And although Anderson wouldn't be a starter for the team, he was getting nearly 27 minutes per game. He would appear in 22 of the Buckeyes' 28 games and would still start eight of them as the freshman Anderson would be one of three Buckeyes to average double figures, while also finishing as the team's second leading distributor and third leading rebounder. And on top of this, he was a defensive pest, leading the team with two steals per game, which was the fourth highest mark in the Big Ten. The Buckeyes without Jackson had their struggles, as they would score nearly 10 less points per game. They would start the year 4-0, and after 11 games were 9-2, but then they would lose six straight and wouldn't be able to regain their footing finishing the year at 15 and 13. But this would include a huge upset over number one ranked Indiana, when the Buckeyes were able to force overtime, then defeat the Hoosiers in the extra period to hand them one of their three regular season losses. But at 15 and 13, the Buckeyes would only get an NIT invitation, where they would lose to Miami of Ohio in the first round, with Anderson's freshman year seeing him average about 10 points, three and a half rebounds, and two and a half assists per game. The 94 Buckeyes were again led by Funderburk and Skelton, but Anderson had been elevated to a full-time starter and had taken a big leap, upping his numbers across the board. Anderson was now the team's second leading scorer and rebounder, while leading the team in assists and steals, again finishing near the top of the conference in that category. Ohio State wasn't having the best year, but it got a lot worse, when after 22 games, Anderson tore the ACL in his left knee, 
ending his season prematurely, as the Buckeyes finished with a 13-16 record and missed the tournament, as Anderson's sophomore year had seen him average about 15 points, 5 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. But Anderson made a decision after the season, and staying at Ohio State wasn't part of it. Ohio State found themselves in hot water during the summer of 94, as they were ultimately given a one-year probation due to recruitment violations. And while this was the breaking point, the Ohio State program was just not in a good place overall. So Anderson, who was only hoping to sit out the beginning of the 95 season as he healed, decided to transfer instead and not lose any eligibility, and therefore technically not miss any games, as he would choose Kentucky after being sold on their up-tempo style by head coach Rick Pitino. As Anderson would defend his decision to transfer, saying that you could feel things collapsing in on the Buckeyes program, and that he wanted to get out before something bad happened. And he got out at a good time, as 95 would see the Buckeyes turn in the worst record in school history while dealing with multiple arrests and suspensions of players. So after sitting out a year, the 96 season began with Anderson as a member of one of the most stacked college basketball teams of all time, as nearly two-thirds of their roster would end up spending time in the NBA. Anderson would ease into a starting role on the team, as he would start 24 of a possible 36 games this season, but more important was that he would play in all 36 games. With talent like Antoine Walker, Tony Delk, Walter McCarty, and Ron Mercer, there were a lot of mouths to feed, but Kentucky would overwhelm the competition all season as the second highest scoring team in the nation. Understandably, Anderson's numbers had taken a hit from his time at Ohio State, but he was still doing a bit of everything, finishing top 5 on the team in points, rebounds, assists, and steals. And having so much offensive talent on the floor led to Anderson getting a lot of high percentage looks, as he would shoot nearly 51% from the field and would even make 39% of his shots from deep. Kentucky would have a disappointing start to the year, losing just their second game of the season to UMass. But after this, they would start running through teams with little resistance as they wouldn't return to losing for the remainder of the regular season, going on a 25-game win streak after their UMass loss, with 22 of those wins coming by 12 points or more. They picked up where they left off in the conference tourney, defeating Florida and then Arkansas in blowouts. But then in the conference championship game, Kentucky would be stunned by Mississippi State, as the Bulldogs would defeat the Wildcats by 11 points to win the SEC. But the Wildcats were still one of the nation's top teams at 28-2 and would get a one seed entering the NCAA tournament, where they would resume their dominance. The first round would see Kentucky dismantle San Jose State, as Anderson would only need to play about 20 minutes, but would still have 10 points on 5 of 7 shooting. Round 2 would be another blowout, this time of Virginia Tech, as Anderson would score 8 points on 3 of 5 shooting. The Sweet 16 brought Utah, and Anderson would show out in another blowout as in just 18 minutes of action, he finished with 18 points and 6 rebounds while going 8 for 8 from the free throw line. The Elite 8 brought Tim Duncan and Wake Forest, but Kentucky would win their 4th straight game by at least 20, as Anderson played great with 12 points, 5 rebounds, and 5 assists on over 57% shooting, as Kentucky's road to the Final Four had been fairly smooth. The Final Four brought the only team to hand the Wildcats a regular season loss in Marcus Camby and UMass. And although this was the Wildcats' first close game of the tourney, they still came out on top. Yet Anderson would get into foul trouble and only finish with 6 points, yet would add 5 rebounds and 4 assists. But the Wildcats were in the national championship game and were set to take on Syracuse. Syracuse would hold Kentucky to their lowest point total of the tournament with their 2-3 zone, as the Wildcats shot below 35% for the game. Yet Anderson would be efficient. As in just about 16 minutes of action, he would have 11 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 steals while shooting 50% from the field and 2 of 3 from deep. And surprisingly, it was Kentucky's defense that propelled them, as they held Syracuse to 67 points while scoring 76 of their own to win their 6th national championship in school history and 1st since 1978, as Anderson's first year as a Wildcat had seen him average about 9.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. Kentucky had lost a lot of firepower to the NBA draft, as Walker, Delk, and McCarty were all gone, but a senior Anderson and sophomore Ron Mercer would step in as the team's new dynamic duo, with hopes of repeating in 1997. The Wildcats were still one of the top offensive teams in the nation, and Anderson was a huge part of that, as one of the nation's top scorers and most exciting players. With his signature play as a Wildcat, coming in a December 31st game versus Louisville, 
transition game, but they have to get under control. How about Derek Anderson again? This would be a game Kentucky would win easily, as this would be their 11th win of a 14 game win streak. As about halfway through the season, they were 14 and 1. They would lose their next game to Mississippi, then beat Georgia, but their following game versus Auburn had Anderson seeing the worst kind of deja vu. While going for a loose ball, Anderson would suffer a non contact injury, initially thought to just be a bone bruise, but it was then announced on January 21st to be a torn ACL, this time in his right knee. As Anderson, who at the time was the SEC's leading scorer, was believed to have played his last college game. But the season would go on, with Kentucky winning the conference tournament and again rolling through the NCAA tournament with relative ease, leading up to a Final Four matchup with Minnesota. But more surprising was that Anderson had been cleared to play a little over three months after his injury, as he would even say that he was dunking and windmilling in practice leading up to the Minnesota game. However, Wildcats head coach Rick Pitino decided that Anderson should not risk his NBA future and would decide not to play him. But he would give Anderson one last chance to step on the court, as after a second half technical foul on Gophers coach Clem Haskins in what would be a Wildcats win, Pitino sent in Anderson to shoot the free throws, marking his only two points of the tourney. Unfortunately, Kentucky would come up just short as they would lose to Arizona in the final two days later with Anderson's shortened season seeing him average about 17.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. Anderson would declare for the draft after the season, but how bad would teams want a player who tore both ACLs in college? With the 13th pick in the 1997 NBA draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers select Derek Anderson from the University of Kentucky. Even after everything he had been through, Anderson had been taken in the top half of the first round, showing just how highly teams thought of him. And one can only wonder how high he could have gone had he not blown out his knee once, let alone twice, in the past three years. But perhaps even more exciting for Anderson was that Michael Jordan was putting together a team of ambassadors for his newly formed Jordan brand. And as Anderson recalls, he would go in for a meeting with who he thought would be Nike executives, but instead would be sitting across from Michael Jordan, who would explain his new brand and ask how Anderson's recovery was coming along. And according to Anderson, Jordan was impressed by his resilience in working back from the injuries and offered him a spot as an inaugural member of Team Jordan. And as Anderson has also explained, he was the one who came up with the idea of making a low-cut version of the Jordan 11, which became the shoe most associated with Anderson. So now the excitement had passed, and it was time for Anderson to join the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Cavs had experienced success throughout the 90s, but never broke through, and now we're transitioning into a new era. They featured good youth with guys like Zadrunas Ilgauskas, Wesley Person, and Brevin Knight, and were led by all-star point guard Terrell Brandon. But then, about a month before the season, the Cavs were involved in a blockbuster trade which saw them ship Brandon away, but receive all-star forward Sean Kemp in return giving them a clear star. Anderson would find himself in a sixth man role for Cleveland. He would actually begin the season as a starter, but after significant shooting struggles over his first 10 games, he was demoted to a bench role, where he would play well. He would hit double figures in 41 games this season, including an April 3rd loss to the Lakers, where he came off the bench to score 30 points on 11 of 15 shooting. Additionally, he would record a 12-point, 14-assist double-double in a November 28th defeat of Charlotte, as he would end up being named second-team All-Rookie. He wouldn't manage a full season, as he was sidelined for all of February, but 66 games wasn't bad for a guy who played more than 22 games in a season just once throughout college. And although the Cavs weren't a great offensive team, they were a great defensive team, and were able to turn in a 47-35 record, which got them a first-round matchup with Indiana. Anderson wouldn't have the best start, as in the first two games he was averaging 7 points on a combined 3 of 10 shooting, with 7 total turnovers, as Cleveland fell behind 0-2. Then Game 3 would see him go for an improved 11, 5, and 5 in a Cavs win. Yet Game 4 was his best, as he finished with 18 points on 5 of 8 shooting, but Cleveland lost to end their season, as Anderson's rookie year had seen him average about 11.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. The 99 Cavs took a step back. Kemp would play well this season, but the lockout over the summer marked the beginning of his unfortunate decline, and a foot injury would limit Ilgauskas to just 5 games this year. Anderson put together a solid season for the Cavs. It wasn't spectacular, but he was still effective, 
yet he would only manage 38 games and really struggled with his shooting as he shot below 40% for the season. He would however start in 13 games and play well in those games, calling on his point guard skills and averaging over 6 assists as he would be the team's second leading distributor on the season. He would still hit double figures in 22 games and record two double doubles which included a 28-point, 10-assist performance in a February 22nd loss to Philadelphia. And at the very least, Anderson was a highlight machine for the Cavs, producing many huge dunks and acrobatic layups. But a beat-up Cavs team would only manage a 22-28 record and miss the playoffs, as Year 2 had seen Anderson average about 11 points, 3 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. But after just two seasons, the Cavs would decide that Anderson wasn't part of their long-term plans. In early August, Anderson was included in a package to the Clippers, as a 25-year-old Anderson was joining one of the league's youngest teams. The Clippers already featured forward Maurice Taylor and former number one overall pick Michael Oluwakandi. Additionally, they had just selected Lamar Odom fourth overall in the draft, as they were a team full of potential. With a larger role as a full-time starter, Anderson would turn in the best season of his career. He would finish second on the team in scoring at a career-high 16.9 points per game, while shooting a less than stellar, but still career-high 43.8% from the field, while also leading the team in steals. But injuries continued to follow Anderson wherever he went, as he would suffer an early season concussion and miss half of December with an ankle injury. But in the games he did play, he would hit double figures in 51 of them, including his career-high of 35 points in a January 27th loss to Dallas. Additionally, he would record a double-double and his first career triple-double in a December 6th loss to Miami when he had 16 points, 10 rebounds, and 12 assists. But Anderson had gone from bad to worse as the Clippers were at the bottom of the league on both ends of the ball as they finished the year at 15-67 and 67, with Anderson's season seeing him average about 17 points, 4 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. But another change was coming for Anderson. A free agent, Anderson wanted out of LA, but was hoping the Clippers would orchestrate a sign-in trade so he could receive a larger payday, and the Clippers felt it was easier to move on from Anderson after acquiring Quentin Richardson and Corey Maggette in the offseason. However, no sign-in trade was completed, and Anderson would instead sign with the Spurs for the 01 season, with an opt-out clause for the 02 season, as he reportedly chose the Spurs over other teams due to their ability to offer him a larger contract the following year. The Spurs were an established team, winning a title in 99. They were led by their twin towers of David Robinson and Tim Duncan, and were looking for a wing scoring presence to take over for Sean Elliott, who had missed nearly all of last season recovering from a kidney transplant, and would play his final season this year. And Anderson would find his groove with the Spurs, becoming their second leading scorer while averaging career highs in rebounding and steals. But most importantly, for the first time in his career, he would play and start in all 82 games at nearly 35 minutes per game. Overall, he would hit double figures in 67 games, including 23 with at least 20, while also recording three double-doubles, and helping the Spurs boast a top three defense in the league. And the Spurs were clicking, as in their final 25 games, they would go 20-5, and five, which included a nine-game win streak, leading to an overall record of 58-24 and, and the top seed in the West. The first round brought Minnesota, and Anderson would finish as one of three Spurs to average double figures, yet he would struggle, shooting below 32% for the series, with his best performance coming in a Game 3 loss when he had 16 points, yet shot just 6 of 16. But even with his offensive woes, the Spurs' defense would shut down the T-Wolves, as they never allowed more than 84 points en route to a four-game series win, setting up a second-round matchup with Dallas. Game 1 began with Anderson again struggling to find his shot, as in the first half he had just 6 points on 1 of 4 shooting. But then, after avoiding injuries all season, the postseason would be a different story. A flagrant foul by Juwan Howard near the end of the first half would see Anderson hit the deck hard on his right arm, forcing him out of the game as it was later diagnosed as a dislocated shoulder, leading to him missing the remainder of the series, which the Spurs won in 5 setting up a conference finals matchup with the Lakers. But this is where their season came to an end, as LA would easily sweep San Antonio. Anderson would return for the final two games, but in those two games, he went 0 for 10 from the field and scored a combined four points, as his first season in San Antonio wrapped up with him averaging about 15 and a half points, 
four and a half rebounds, and three and a half assists per game. Over the offseason, the Spurs reportedly offered Anderson a six year, $43 million deal. But surprisingly, Anderson would decline, even though they were apparently asking franchise legend David Robinson to take a pay cut just so they could sign Anderson. Reportedly, the contract was incentive laden and also had a deadline, which Anderson didn't appreciate, as he would say that he was waiting for them to negotiate a contract, but then when they offered one, they told him they needed an answer promptly. So with Anderson swearing off San Antonio, the Spurs found a trade partner, and in late July, Anderson headlined a package sent to Portland in a sign and trade deal for a package headlined by Steve Smith, as by the end of it, Anderson had agreed to a six-year deal worth a total of $48 million. So Anderson joined a Blazers team who had recently made back-to-back -back conference finals appearances, but were growing increasingly dysfunctional, yet still featured some good talent like Rasheed Wallace, Damon Stoudemire, and Bonzi Wells. Anderson began the year as a starter and was putting up solid numbers, but about a third of the way into the season, head coach Maurice Cheeks would shift Anderson to a sixth man role, as although his minutes dropped, his production was still good. He would appear in 70 games and would hit double figures in 38 of them, including a 15-point, 10-assist double-double, the November 6th defeat of Utah. And the Blazers were still one of the league's better teams, as they would finish the season at 49-33 and, and get a first-round matchup with the Lakers. The series would be closer than expected, but LA was just too much for Portland, as they would sweep the Blazers. Anderson would come off the bench to average nearly 15 points per game as the team's third leading scorer, as he would hit double figures in all three games. Game 1 was the best postseason game of his career, as he went for 22 points on 8 of 14 shooting. He would cool down in Game 2 with 10 points and 3 assists, but did go 6 of 6 from the line. Then Game 3 saw him put up 12 points and 3 assists, yet shoot just 3 of 12 from the field, as Anderson's first season as a Blazer had seen him average about 11 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Anderson would be promoted to a full-time starter in 2003 as he would start all 76 games that he appeared in and finish as the team's third leading scorer. Additionally, with Stoudemire missing 23 games this year, Anderson was able to get some opportunities to show his passing ability as his 4.3 assists per game would be second on the team and a then career high. Overall, Anderson would hit double figures in 56 games, including 14 with at least 20 and two double doubles with December being his best month of the season, as both of his double-doubles came during this month, as well as a December 21st game which saw Anderson go for 27 points and hit the game-winning three with seconds left to defeat the Seattle Supersonics. And in a bit of a surprise, the Blazers put together a 50-win season, and this time would face Dallas in round one. Anderson would go scoreless in about 19 minutes of action in a game one loss, then early in game two he would suffer torn cartilage in his knee, which would end his postseason. The beat-up Blazers were able to push the series to 7, but Dallas came out on top, as Anderson's season had ended with him averaging about 14 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. The 4 season marked the end of an era in Portland. Longtime center Arvidas Sabonis retired for good, and Scottie Pippen would return to the Chicago Bulls. Additionally, both Bonzi Wells and Rasheed Wallace would be traded before the deadline, so Anderson was one of their longest tenured players by season's end but it had been a difficult season for him, as he would struggle with back spasms, only appearing in 51 games. When he did play, he put up similar numbers to last year, but was shooting below 38%. He would still end the year second on the team in scoring and assists, as his 4.5 assists per game would be a career high. Even with the injuries, he was a starter when he did play, and would hit double figures in 38 games, including 12 with at least 20. But all the roster turnover led to the Blazers declining, Yet not as much as one might expect, as they still turned in a 500 season at 41 and 41, but it wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth, as Anderson's season had ended with him averaging about 13.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. The 05 season would be forgettable for Anderson, as he would appear in just 47 games, as it seemed that his body was really starting to fail him, but maybe that wasn't the whole story. As Anderson would explain, the Blazers had an already bad image and were looking for a scapegoat. They were in the middle of one of their worst seasons in franchise history and Anderson would say that everyone wanted out, including him, as he demanded a trade and was told to go home while the Blazers worked on something. But Anderson would then say that in an attempt to look for someone to blame their terrible season on, the Blazers started to list Anderson out of games for seemingly very minor injuries. However, they were believable, as Anderson had reportedly sat out a game earlier in the year for a toothache 
yet then been spotted at a local drive through but now they could blame the reason for their losing on a seemingly uncommitted player. And Anderson would say that they chose him due to the fact that on a roster with many players who have been in trouble with the law, he was the top player to not have any off-court issues, as they thought he wouldn't badmouth them. And regardless of how much truth there is in this story, what is true is that Anderson appeared in just 8 of Portland's final 42 games, as they finished with a 27-55 record and missed the playoffs with Anderson's tumultuous year seeing him average about 9 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. But this offseason would see Anderson make a bit of NBA history. With 2 years remaining on his contract, the Blazers exercised the league's new amnesty clause on Anderson, making him the first player in league history waived using this rule. And just a few weeks later, he would sign a 2-year deal with the Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming-led Houston Rockets. Anderson would appear in the team's first 20 games, beginning the year as a starter before losing his spot to David Wesley. And then Anderson would start being bothered by a sore knee and a calf strain, keeping him out for nearly two months. And before making a return for the Rockets, he was instead shipped to Miami around the deadline. Anderson joined a Heat team sitting at 34-20 and 20 and led by Dwayne Wade and Shaquille O'Neal. He would see a decreased role in Miami, but would still appear in 23 games and start three of them. As the Heat finished the year at 52-30, and 30, and got a first round matchup with Chicago. Anderson would miss the first two games of the series with a stomach virus, but come back to score a combined 14 points across the next two, as overall Miami would defeat Chicago in six games and advance to the conference semis versus New Jersey. After appearing in the first two games, Anderson would log DNPs over the rest of the series, as the Heat would gentlemen sweep the Nets and would take on the defending conference champion Detroit Pistons next. This would be a six game series win for Miami, yet Anderson would appear in just two games, playing a combined five minutes. The final challenge was the Dallas Mavericks in the finals, and although Miami fell behind two games to none, an MVP performance from Wade would see them win the series in six, as Anderson did not appear in the finals, but he could still call himself a champion as one of very few to win both an NCAA and NBA title, but his overall season had seen him average about eight points, three and a half rebounds, and two and a half assists per game. Miami would buy out the remainder of Anderson's contract, making him a free agent going into 07. He would be without a team for the first month of the year before signing with Charlotte in late November. The Bobcats were still a new team, and a now 32-year-old Anderson would act as a veteran presence, yet still give the Bobcats good minutes and production. He would appear in 50 games and start 32 of them, and his 42.9% shooting would be the second highest mark of his career. But the Bobcats were still in just their third year of existence, and would finish with a 33-49 and record and miss the playoffs, as Anderson's year had seen him average about 8 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. Anderson was back for the Bobcats in 08, but wouldn't spend a lot of time on the court, as he would appear in just 28 games, putting up career-low averages on career-low minutes, as it was clear his body could no longer handle the wear and tear of the NBA, and the Bobcats stayed about the same, going 32-50 and and missing the playoffs as Anderson's year had seen him average about 5 points, 2 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. 08 would mark the end of Anderson's playing career. Derek Anderson seemed to have everything you wanted in a star, from his game, to his personality, to how he carried himself off the court. But even when you have all the tools, it doesn't always work out, and DA is a prime example of that. His childhood alone is a lot of adversity, but then overcoming torn ACLs on both knees, before the end of college is another story, yet he always came back with a smile on his face. And while some might criticize him for being in it for the money, he was homeless as a child and a teenage single father, with multiple blown out knees. He knew how fast things could be taken away and wanted to make sure him and his kids were secure. But Anderson was also one of the best players in the nation during his college years pre and post injury, and played a huge role on a championship team. Then instead of taking it easy on his knees in the NBA, he continued his highlight reel play, looking to dunk on anyone and everyone, and never looking like he was worried about injury. He may not have been consistent, but he was exciting, and he helped give Portland a constant during the Jailblazers era, and he was special enough to become an inaugural member of the prestigious Jordan Brand fraternity, and there's not many who can say that. But that's it for today's episode on Derek Anderson. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his Cleveland teammates, or this one on another Kentucky basketball legend. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.